Welcome to the show. I'm Jessica Shaw. I'm Torre. And this is Bingeworthy. We tell you what to binge. And what to delete. Today we're looking at new episodes of South Park. The final season of The Mindy Project. And the return of The Good Place. Cheers to fun shows about hell. And thanks to our host, Vinyl, in New York City. All right, Jess, let's talk TV. South Park returned for its 21st season on Comedy Central. New episodes air every Wednesday at 10 p.m. This is how we do it. Great. This is how we do it. Ooh. This is how we do it. It's Wednesday night and I feel all right. The party is here on the west side. I'm kind of buzzed and it's all because. This is how we Great season premiere they had this year. First of all, 21 seasons. I have to say, I was I watched this show every yeah. single week when it came on. You yeah. know how it is. A show that is running for a really long time. You kind of like, you know, you lose track of it. You check in with other Wednesday night shows. <laughs> and then you come back. And like this show in particular, they're tackling technology, yep. white supremacists, yep. gender roles, how men are all like, we love Alexa because you don't answer back. You don't you demand <laughs> nothing of us. At one point, Cartman actually says, you're so subservient, Alexa. <laughs> and it's like a, like a love story that he it, will never have with it, his it's girlfriend. It's one of the most genius moments when he creates this sort of symphony with like a whole bunch of Alexas that yes. he's found. He's like, if I say this one thing, then it will resound to all of them. And it's just the most brilliant little Cartman-y thing that he's ever done. I mean, look, this show has been on forever, and it's still fresh and fun and yes. interesting and real and alive. And they've never shied away from politics. And they're diving into dealing with white supremacy and white people renovating homes. I am so thrilled that this still exists and it still has the teeth and the strength and the balls to do whatever they want. And they still are so funny. It's hard to make, maintain right. comedy over a long period of time. They are crushing it. I totally agree. Um, Trey Parker and Matt Stone, of course, they turn in the episodes like five seconds before they air. And I'm sure every executive at Comedy Central is like uh, cursing them. But because of that, the shows are so relevant. Yeah. They're right on the news. And they're so hilarious. And it's like, who cares about, you know, the these sort of crudely drawn uh, sketches and the animation and everything? I don't care because the comedy is so good and it's so biting. And there's something genius in that they are forever in the fifth grade. They don't oh, age. Yeah. Nothing and like that's like a joke on itself. On like because television, you know, the actors, the real actors are going to age. So the sh shows with children or teenagers are going to not this show. We are forever stuck. No one's going through an awkward phase. No one's going through an awkward phase. I mean, no Carmen. one's growing up. No, right. yeah, it was perpetual awkward. Phase. Yeah. but that's because he's an asshole. Yeah, <laughs> it's he's different. To he totally is, but he's an asshole. Like I want to watch. And with yeah. this season premiere, I think of like what are the great uh, South Park episodes of all time? You've got oh my God, the Kanye. Scientology one. The Kanye one was amazing. And then this one, I have to say, I think this one could go down in the history. When this show is off the air in like 30 years, when Matt and Trey are like in you know an old age home somewhere, people are going to look back at this season premiere and think this was one of the great I ones. I mean, there was an epic trilogy they did once where the you know all the good imaginary creatures were fighting against all the bad, evil imaginary creatures, and it was so epic and like almost movie-like. Uh, that is definitely one of their great achievements of all time. I mean, I just remember when this came on, and we had such reverence for The Simpsons, right. right? And it was such a great, groundbreaking, brilliant comedy, and it still is. And South Park came in and immediately like kicked it off the throne, and it's like, no, we are funnier, we are sharper, we are more badass, and it's still And we're still not bad. confined to network standards yeah. and practices, which yeah. is a whole other thing. Yeah. So if you had to choose Simpsons or South Park. South Park. Really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so, and, and taking nothing away from Simpsons. Right. Great show, but come on. Yeah. South I mean, the Park? first like Respect eight seasons. Respect my authority. Uh, I mean, the first eight <laughs> seasons of, of Simpsons are like probably, yeah. you know, some of the great television we've ever seen in yeah. our life. But I agree with you. I think as if you're looking at the entire body of work, yeah. South Park has been consistently funnier. Yes. Even if those first seasons of The Simpsons are untouchable. Indeed. So I'm guessing you're binging this show. Super binging this show. I've been binging the show basically yes. for 21 years. So like, hell yeah. Still love South Park. Still love it so much. Definitely binging it on Wednesdays and also like, you know, on syndication at 11 o'clock every night. Yes. So watching it there too. It's mm -hmm. amazing. All right, coming up next, we'll talk about the Mindy Project. And season two of The Good Place.
Welcome back, I'm Torre. I'm Jessica Shaw. And this is Bingeworthy. We tell you what to binge. And what to delete. And Mindy Kaling's The Mindy Project is entering its sixth and final season on Hulu, a sort of second death for this long-running show. I was in this place, and you were there. You were there. You were there. We were having group sex. Ah! No! You're trying too hard to look sexy. It's not an effort. Ew. You know you can join our team anytime. I don't have to be gay yet. Swing. Hey, Cliff. It's your favorite ex-girlfriend. Oh, no. But for me, never lived up to its potential. Um, really? I'm super glad that the Mindy Project existed. I'm glad that Mindy Kaling got her shot to do her thing the way she wanted to do it. But it's just never really been that funny. It's never been that crisp. It's never been that smart. The Kelly Kapoor I fell in love with is nowhere in existence here. and Because it's a different character. I get that, but there was an intelligence, there was a wit, there was a speed to her that's not in evidence here. I, I, I'm glad that this car got to drive around uh, off the lot, but it, it deserves to be rested. It's just not that funny. I have to say, the second half of season one, in season two of The Mindy Project, when it was on Fox, some of the funniest moments in sitcom history. Like, I thought that show was brilliant. But I, I agree with you in the sense that when it went over to Hulu, it lost something. Yeah. And I kind of, I lost track of it. That said, going back, and I feel like, don't you want to finish a show? If you watch the beginning of a show, don't you want to watch the final season? I, I do, but that's if they're compelling me with there's a storyline. Are Jim and Pam actually going to get married? Are, you know, is Walter White going right. to be brought to justice? Or we, like, is there a story? Is there a question? Are there questions that I'm dying to have answered about the characters? Other than that, there's been plenty of shows oh. that sort of peter out for me. I mean, like, I'm no longer dying to see what oh. happens on Empire. Like, there are things that, like, peter out. I mean, this... This this didn't even peter out. I was not really in. I remember you never watching loved it the show. No, right. I didn't. It's not that funny. It's I mean, kind of wooden. I wish that it was sharper and a little edgier. I would say to go back and watch season two, which was one of the sharpest seasons of television I've ever seen. Mm. I agree with you. It got like it was. It's okay, but I'm a completist. I even finished nine hundred two another reboot. Wow. I, I know. I did. I like to finish a season, even if I skip the middle. I like to watch the end. So I was like, I'm all in. I'm going to watch the final season. These first few episodes are fine. It definitely feels like they're on the farewell tour. They're bringing back all the old characters. Right. Glenn Howerton's back. Adam Pally's back. Chris Messina's going to be coming back. I think in episode three, they allude to how they will be bringing him back. And it's nice to see, like, the old gang back together. But I just don't feel like the show holds the magic that it once did, with one exception. Ike Barinholtz is consistently the hero of that show. He is so... So I'm just funny. struggling to find any character that I'm really compelled to follow and interested in. I'm not really interested in this world. I'm not interested in these people. They make me laugh sometimes, but not really. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy that Mindy got to do her thing, but it's just not that funny. So I'm it's deleting this. It's not the this. great show that it was. I'm excited. I think Mindy Kaling is a great comedic talent. I'm looking forward to what she does next. Yeah. I feel like she peaked in season two. And then maybe the show shouldn't have gone to Hulu. So are you binging season six or deleting season six? I am going to binge season six because I just, I, I have a feeling that it's going to be. a charity binge. It's a little bit of a charity binge. Oh, but my God. I love charity. All the things that you. I'm a do-gooder. Uh, I'm like a TV. Do I'm a binging do-gooder. All the things that you committed to binge and you're going to have time for this too. And children. And well, no. work. They're like my priority. You gotta, yeah, you gotta, you gotta put like a stop somewhere. Good shows, you, Mindy Project, children. Don't ask me to babysit your children because you need to watch Mindy Project because you can't handle all the things going on in your life. The I'm call is coming. I am deleting this because I don't have time. It's not that good, and I'm sorry. Mike Schur's acclaimed comedy, The Good Place, returns to NBC for a second season on Wednesday, September 20th at 10 p.m. Welcome. You've reached your final destination. Don't worry, you're in the good place. So prepare to enjoy all that your neighborhood has to offer. You'll meet fascinating people. Oh, oh you booped me. <laughs> I did. Live in beautiful homes and dine on non-stop gourmet food. This is going to make a primo dump later on. Everything here is designed for your happiness. 
Huh. I've never been more stressed out in my entire life. Welcome to the good place. This was not a sure thing that this show would get a second season. Okay. It was a show that I think critics liked. I loved it. I'm pretty sure you really liked it too. But it was a little complex. Like, you know, the, uh, this woman played by Kristen Bell wakes up. Is she in heaven, which they call the good place? Or is it something else? Ted Danson plays her, sort of the, her Julie McCoy, her well, kind we, of tour guide. Well, we are led to think for, what, 11 episodes of the right, first season right. that she is in heaven. Right. And then it turns out no. uh, maybe it's not quite a good no. place. In season two, they do such a smart thing. They essentially reboot the whole show in case you missed season one, in case you were, like, off watching something else. And they reboot it, and they have her wake up again, but they erased her memory. They, like, totally did an eternal sunshine thing that you'd love to do. <laughs> but... And Right, but she's left an Easter egg for herself. Right, so so the the Ted Danson who is trying to torture her and all of these other people in this alleged good place, I said, this you is know actually what? Actually, the bad place. Right, let's figure out a way to torture these people who have arrived, who have died in a totally different place. He has this great moment in like a very Ted Danson who just like you can't not root for. He says like, all right, guys, torture on three, one, two, three, and they're like torture. torture. <laughs> I love this show. It's so smart. In some ways, you can see why it wasn't a, a runaway hit because it's a little complex and you have to think a little bit so it's not a traditional sitcom, but it is so good. It is, it is complex, and I love this show, and I loved it even more as I got to know it better. Yes. I, I love the initial premise. And then about four or five episodes into the first season, I was like, hmm, it's not developing. There's really nowhere to go. Like, here's where we are, and that's all it is, and... I'm not that interested. But then when I came around to later in the season and they changed and actually, it's not the good place. It's actually the bad place. Right. Pretending to be the good place to screw with them even more. I'm like, what is this Kafka-esque fantasy? I love this. Yes. It is so smart. It is so interesting. When, they, when it finally turns and Kristen Bell's like, no, we're in the bad place. And because I've been wondering, I have all these questions. Why could you sneak into heaven? That doesn't make any sense. And I'm not just one person. Multiple people have accidentally gotten to heaven. No, that doesn't make sense. When are they going to explain that? No, they're all in hell. It's so smart. It, it's so sweet and cute and yet devious and smart. Yes. Network doesn't do this anymore. I know, which is why I'm right? sure it'll be canceled this year. <laughs> but until it is, everyone needs to watch it because it's so good because yeah. it needs to get canceled so it can get like picked up by streaming service because right. I feel like it has arrested development syndrome a little bit. Right. It's like you're too good for network television. You're too smart and too clever I mean, and too witty. It reminds me of things that NBC has done in the past that are really smart and have a deep sense of morality. Like my name is Earl. Right. right? Like the through line was this deep sense of morality, right? And it was very smart and, you know, we very well constructed, and it seemed too good for network. NBC has done this sort of thing before, so I believe that they could want to stick with this and ride right. this out. I, I mean, just... I <laughs> the show is so smart and fun and great. And I love it, yeah. I, I mean, you know, just the the... And the way they keep turning it. You don't usually see a show really flip from season one to season two, and yet it fully makes sense. And they keep bringing in new parts of the world with, you know, the medium place and the bad Janet yes. to counteract the good Janet. And, it, I mean, it's there's just so much here. It's I love a, this it's show. A, it's like, it's a really is a little gem. I want everyone to binge this show because it's so clever it's so good yeah i'm guessing you're gonna binge this no too. I'm, i've been binging it and i will continue to binge it i'm totally in love with this all right <laughs> <laughs> i'm coming up for a look at the new comedy me uh. myself and i Welcome back, I'm Tori. I'm Jessica Shaw. This is still binge-worthy. We're going to tell you what to binge. And what to delete. Bobby Moynihan left SNL and got himself a new job on a show called Me, Myself, and I that premieres Monday, September 25th at 9.30 on CBS. Yes! Woo! Hey, honey, you know that pilot I've been seeing? The one from L.A.? He asked me to marry him. And just like that, I was forced to live in a house smack dab in the middle of Laker country. That wouldn't be the worst day of my life. 
Not by a long shot. Dad, where's my lunch? Oh, boy. Leaving my daughter's lunch on the kitchen table isn't the bad thing I was talking about. Sarah! Sarah! This is. Oh, oh, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh. Well, at least when life hits rock bottom, things can't get any worse, right? Wrong. When you're ranking life-changing days, it's hard to top the one where you almost die. <laughs> what the hell is going on with this? It is just not funny, it's so stale, so just weird, the jumping around at different points oh, of life. Oh, terrible. I can't with this at all. And it's, also- It's not Imaginary Mary bad, but it's bad. Uh, is it Imaginary Mary bad? No, no, Imaginary no, no, Mary it's not, it's worse. Not. Okay, it's also definitely Also the worse. SNL family tree. Yeah, it's true, with Rachel Dredge. But love Rachel Dredge. Love Rachel Dredge. Um, but hate Imaginary Mary. I have to say, this show <laughs> drove me so crazy because not one of the three storylines, like you said, it takes place in uh, three different time periods uh, of this guy's life. Simultaneously. Not one is compelling. And they're like, no. you know what? <laughs> All three time periods kind of suck. So let's, <laughs> let's like meld them together well, and maybe it'll make one like halfway decent show. Can't no. We can't come up with one story they'll watch. So we'll come up with three stories they don't want to watch and just smush them together. And it just had that that ridiculous, like they think that they're like, ah, we'll got one for the audience. We're gonna be funny, but we're also gonna be heartfelt. We're gonna be a good dad, and we're gonna have him like live in the garage and be totally unfunny, but also like love his daughter. Yeah. That's not enough to get an audience. This was such an epic fail to me, and it was the worst kind because it was manipulative, and they thought that they were getting you. They thought you were getting you with like an emotional hook. Yeah. And it drove me crazy yeah. because it was neither compelling on an emotional level, nor was it funny on any level. No, it's not funny, and I found it really, I just found it disconcerting the way that Bobby Moynihan's character, middle age, has got nothing going on. Right. And then somehow, by his, by his later years, the John Larroquette character, is rich and powerful and right. running things. And I'm like, no. Like, I don't, I don't, you know, like, no. Just, I, I just, no. I'm also, just rejecting that. that. Whole, there's a really weird moment at the end of the first episode where John Larroquette, who, by the way, like, he's a good actor. Like, he can, I he feel is, like he should be funny. able to do better than that. I actually hated his plot the most. Why? There's, I just, he drove me crazy how he, he's, there's this, oh, there's always a woman that the, like, the old schlubby white guy's been pining after for 40 years. That plot, like, oh, never seen that before. And John Lauer Kidd goes, he sees the woman and she's a waitress now and he goes back and he plants a kiss on her. It just felt a little bit, a, a little, cliche. like, borderline assaulty mm. and, uh, and just so <laughs> cliched. And I just, it, it was, <laughs> it did not work on any no. level. It's a hot steaming mess. I'm going to use the eternal sunshine of the mind machine and erase this from the brain. I don't want me, myself, and I to exist in my memory at all. Yeah, Super I mean, deleting. I agree. I absolutely hated this show. They can all do better. I am deleting it. Like yeah. anytime you have an SNL person, they mm. want it to prove that like, they're not just a sketch comedian. And they can do something different. But I feel like this was not even close to being the project. Be for a sketch him. comedian. It's fine. Yeah. Well, whatever. Do it's better than this. Performance of the week goes to Sunday night's Emmy Awards, the first ever hosted by Stephen Colbert. There were so many great moments throughout the show. We're gonna tell you what our favorite moments were. I loved Colbert and Kimmel in the audience making fun of John Oliver. It kind of felt like we were in on like a secret club, like mm -hmm. the, the white men who get to host late night shows, right? They let Samantha B in, but nobody else. And they're drinking. You and I are so and not let in that club, no, yeah. No, no. No. And they're talking shit about the guy who won. and. I, I thought that was really funny. Yeah, I agree, because also you have these moments where the host, everything the host does is so scripted. Right. And I think that Colbert was really good, but that moment felt a little bit fresh. It was reactive. They yeah. were doing something that had just happened on the show, even if they pre-planned it, which I'm sure they did. Yeah. But it was a really, really funny moment. How they make fun of him today. Oh, he just has to be funny one night a week. And yeah, I thought that was really good. Yeah, can only make one a week. That's funny. I think my favorite <laughs> show, just on the optics alone, was seeing the 9 to 5 reunion. Loved seeing those ladies, Dolly Parton, Lily Tomlin, Jane Fonda in her pony. Her pony in her pink. Mm. L stop it. Mm. Stop it. Mm. She's perfect. Was it age appropriate? It was totally age appropriate. It was what? everything appropriate. No, it was not. Jane Fonda. You might want to defend it, but it was not age appropriate. She's perfect. <laughs> I loved seeing 9 to 5 up there. I thought they were amazing. And like Dolly making vibrator jokes. What's okay. bad about that? Okay. The Emmys are supposed to be fun. They tried to be fun with the Sean Spicer moment. I and many others found it fairly offensive. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, why is this funny? He's basically conceding there, like, yes, I lied to the nation, and now 
let's make a big joke out of it. Ha ha, you guys. And like, no, the press secretary's job is not to lie to the nation and perpetuate disinformation. Right. And that you did that is horrifying and that you want to make a joke about it. And I don't want to see people come out of the White House and like, let's make jokes out of us being part of this administration that is sort of damaging the country. Like, no. And especially right. making it's fun of the things that you did to damage the country. Like, no, this is not a joke. It's, it's not just a to me, show. like, if you look up in the dictionary the word normalizing, right. that moment of the Emmys is, is right there. And I yeah. just felt like it, there was that initial moment of like, oh my God, he actually agreed to go out there with the podium that Melissa McCarthy used to make fun of him on Saturday Night Live. Isn't this a funny moment? And then you take, and then you think about it for one more second, and you feel very uncomfortable. Like, yeah. no, 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 this isn't funny. This isn't, this isn't Scaramucci talking about going on Dancing with the Stars. Right. This is a whole other level of icky. Yeah. And I just thought, for you know, I was surprised that Colbert did it. He had some really biting jokes that I thought were good. And I have heard the argument that politics should be kept out of a show like the Emmys. No. But to me, yeah. um, that's Colbert's. That's what he does. And I, I just, I was really disappointed that they brought. I Spicer was disappointed out. from with the Emmys that nobody in the group making the show said, "Wait a minute, should we do this? Right. This seems wrong." And maybe there was an internal debate. Maybe it'll leak out this week. You know, those of us who didn't want that to happen, but. No, I mean, like, people should have said, that's too far. Right. You know, and teasing them is one thing, but just having them come out to make a laugh about what they did in the White House. But you know what was the no. best? That Melissa McCarthy, You could, there were some people who were like, oh, my God, this is so funny. And then Melissa McCarthy was like, nope. No. She was just sort of like, no. mm, she kept tapping her nose, and she was just, she was sort of not having it. Okay. That's it for the show. Thanks for watching. I'm Jessica Shaw. I'm Torre, and this has been Bingeworthy. Cheers to Ted Danson. Why not? <laughs> <laughs>